Welcome. My name is Taylor Getz. I'm a Apache Storm committer and member of technical staff at Hortonworks. Um, I'm here today to talk about Storm, real-time big data, and the Storm architecture and integration. Normally, I'd, when I start one of these presentations, I'd ask a lot of people um, how many people in the audience have heard of Storm, but if you were at any of the keynotes yesterday, chances are you've heard of Storm. So why are we here? What do we hope to get from using all the components in the Hadoop ecosystem? We hope to gain insight from our data. We hope to gain insight from all our data. Storm is about gaining insight from our data in real time. So what is Storm? Storm is streaming. Storm is a key enabler of the Lambda architecture. In the Lambda architecture, Storm represents the speed layer, while Hadoop represents the batch layer. Storm is fast. Storm's been clocked at processing 100 million plus messages per second per node. Storm is scalable. Storm scales to thousands of workers per cluster. And Storm is fault tolerant. In storm, failure is expected and failure is embraced. Storm is reliable. It guarantees message delivery and supports both at least once and exactly once semantics. So let's look at the conceptual model of storm. Conceptually, storm computations consist of tuples, streams, spouts, bolts that fit together to form what's called a topology. The tuple. The tuple is the primary data structure in Storm. It's essentially a, an immutable set of key value pairs uh, that gets serialized among the nodes within a cluster. Multiple tuples in sequence form a stream. A stream is essentially an unbounded sequence of tuples. Spouts. Spouts form a source of streams. They wrap a, a source of data streams and emit tuples. An example of that would be a, a queue, such as a Kafka queue, or a sensor, sensor data, um, AMQP queues. And spouts may replay tuples in the event of failure. So if downstream, processing fails for a tuple, Storm can detect that and replay the tuple so it's reliable. Spouts have a simple API. It includes a lifecycle API and the core API. This is the main method of a spout. This is where Storm calls this method and you prepare your data and send it out and it fans out into the Storm cluster. And then, as I'll show you later, Storm has a reliability API for acknowledging processing of a tuple as well as failing a tuple for replay. And bolts, bolts represent the core functions of a streaming computation. Bolts receive tuples and do stuff, and they may optionally emit additional tuple streams. So bolts may write to a data store, Bolts may read from a data store, and bolts may perform arbitrary computation. And bolts can optionally emit additional streams. The Bolt API is also very similar to the Spout API. It's simple. There are lifecycle methods for preparing uh, whatever resources a bolt might need, like database connections, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's a core API. And the execute method in a bolt is where you, you do your processing. That's where your computation happens. I mentioned earlier that bolts may optionally emit streams of tuples. The core API for emitting data from a bolt is 
an interface called the output collector. And the output collector provides multiple methods for emitting to other bolts within a, a stream. And bolts also participate in um, reliability, so they have a reliability API, uh, much like spouts as well. Topologies. Topologies represent the full computation, the full streaming computation. So topologies are a directed acyclic graph of spouts and bolts exchanging streams of tuples. A topology is a representation of a streaming computation. Some low-level details. Topologies are packaged as a jar consisting of the user code and any dependencies that it may require, similar to a Hadoop job jar. Storm executes spouts and bolts as individual tasks that run in parallel on multiple machines. And that, I will get deeper into that later, that's what allows Storm to scale a streaming computation. So those lines that you see in the previous diagram are come down to what are called stream groupings. They represent the edges in the topology DAG. Stream groupings determine how storm routes tuples between tasks in a topology. And there are multiple stream groupings that you can use. Um, I'm only going to cover a couple of the most often used ones. Um, for example, the first one is shuffle. And what shuffle does is it will shuffle tuples between, so if you emit data from one bolt and it goes to another bolt, and there are multiple tasks running that bolt across your cluster, the shuffle grouping will do a round robin, randomized round robin among those tasks. Then there's what's called a local or shuffle, and that's essentially a shuffle where it will prefer an intra-worker or a local task as opposed to another task potentially involving network transfer. Fields groupings. Fields groupings ensure that all tuples with the same field values are always routed to the same task. And the way it does that is a simple hash mod of the number of tasks um, with the hash of the, the values within that tuple. The canonical example for a fields grouping is a word count example. So let's say you have a, a bolt in your topology that is parallelized across multiple machines, and it's counting words. So if you omit a word with a count, you always want that same word to go to the same task in the cluster. Otherwise, your word counts are going to be off. So that's where fields groupings come into play. So let's look at the physical view. In Storm, there are multiple daemons. Um, there's what's called the Nimbus node. And Nimbus is roughly equivalent to a master node in Hadoop. It handles topology submission and code distribution. It performs task assignments across the cluster and monitors the health of the cluster. And you'll see examples of that a little bit later. Zookeeper is used for storing and tracking cluster state and tracking worker and task assignments and also handling heartbeats between the components so Nimbus knows what's going on with the other components in the cluster. And supervisor nodes are essentially like a, a task tracker in Hadoop. Um, they are your, your slave nodes, essentially. And what supervisors do is receive notifications from Nimbus through Zookeeper. Um, for example, like a topology submission or a task assignment. And based on the work that they've been assigned, they will spin up workers. And workers are essentially um, a JVM instance that runs code from your topology, tasks and bolts. Um, workers within workers, 
There are what are, what are called executors, and executors are just Java threads. And I'll get into um, how workers and executors relate a little bit later. So what happens when you submit a topology? Um, you run the storm executable, and you give it a jar file. And a component of storm called the topology submitter will upload that information to Nimbus. The information it uploads is the topology jar itself, the topology code serialized, and then the configuration for that topology also serialized. It uploads that to Nimbus. Nimbus calculates the assignments. So looking at the configuration, how you've configured your parallelism and the relationships between your spouts and bolts, Nimbus will figure out how to assign that work out to workers in the cluster, and it pushes that information into ZooKeeper. Then ZooKeeper nodes through watches set in ZooKeeper, or I'm sorry, supervisor nodes through watches set in ZooKeeper will receive assignment information via ZooKeeper watches. Next, the supervisor nodes will download the topology from Nimbus. They download the topology jar the topology, the serialized topology, and the configuration. And then based on that, they will spawn worker JVM processes to execute the topology. So fault tolerance, what happens when things go down? What happens when a supervisor dies or something goes wrong? Workers heartbeat back to back to the supervisors as well as Nimbus via ZooKeeper as well as locally. They do it locally for um, redundancy in the event that there are issues with ZooKeeper. If a worker dies, meaning it fails to heartbeat, the supervisor will automatically restart it. If a worker re dies repeatedly, Nimbus will pick up on that fact and essentially blacklist that supervisor and take the work that had been assigned to that supervisor and redistribute it among the cluster. Same thing goes for if a supervisor node dies. So if a whole worker node, a whole slave node goes down, Nimbus will reassign that work across the cluster. If Nimbus goes down, your deployed topologies will still continue to function but it won't be able to handle additional topology submissions or be able to redistribute work. So this is usually not a big, big deal because Storm's daemons are fail fast and are run under supervision. So if something goes wrong, the supervisor daemon, whether it's something like supervisor D or monit or daemon tools, will automatically restart the daemon and it should pick up where it left off. Um, but if Nimbus goes down, while it's down, your topologies will still continue to process data as it's coming in. So parallelism, how do you scale a distributed computation? To scale a computation, you increase the number of workers assigned to a topology, as well as the number of tasks that run in parallel. So in Storm, each worker runs multiple threads called executors. And each executor runs one or more tasks. Here we have a topology consisting of a single spout and two bolts. We requested one worker for the topology and a parallelism of one across the topology. Storm will run three tasks with one thread for each task in one worker. Now let's change that a little bit so we want to parallelize the second bolt, so it runs two tasks in parallel. Here we've set up, we've requested one worker, one executor for the spout, and two executors for the second bolt. So now we have two threads running in parallel, and the third bolt is a single thread. But you can also assign multiple tasks to a single executor. Here we've set the parallelism of the second bolt to two and the number of tasks to two. So those tasks get piled on top of one another within the executor, so one thread is running both of those 
tasks. Here we've requested three workers. So Storm will allocate three JVM processes for your topology. We've set the parallelism of each, spout, each task, spout and two bolts, to one and the number of tasks to one. So each worker has one executor running one task. So given those numbers, you can see how you can, depending on how many uh, machines you have in your cluster, how many workers per machine you have, you can tweak those numbers to uh, parallelize your topology how you best see fit. So internal messaging. So I mentioned that workers and tasks fan out across the, uh, your storm cluster. What are the mechanics of that? So let's look at what goes, in so goes on inside a worker. So this represents a single worker, so a JVM. Um, what happens is Storm uses Netty for um, inter-worker inter communication, and Netty on the worker port will receive tuples coming in, and will put them into a receive buffer. And the receive buffer is, at this point, is just a, a simple Java collection. And there's a worker thread that spins across that collection, picking up what's come in and handing it off to a router. And the router then passes it off to multiple executors. An executor thread has something, has both an inbound queue and an outbound queue, and there's something special about those. Instead of using a Java collection, these both use the LMAX disruptor. The LMAX disruptor is a high-performance, non-blocking ring buffer implementation, which is, is pretty awesome in terms of performance. Um, prior to version 0 0.80 of Storm, um, we were using um, Java Util concurrent structures for the inbound buffers and or the internal buffers. And when we switched to the disruptor, it helped improve performance by more than a factor of three. So the router fills these, this inbound buffer, and the executor thread takes data off those buffers and then runs them through the execute uh, method in your tasks, your bolt execute method, as fast as it can. And those are layered. That represents the fact that you can have multiple tasks running within one executor. So after your tasks have processed the incoming data and optionally sent data, any data that's coming out of those tasks will be put in an outbound queue. And then there's a send thread that reads from that queue as fast as it can and transfers that over to a worker transfer thread. And the worker transfer thread is to, its job is to fill a buffer that another netty process is reading as fast as it can and routing that data to other workers in the topology. So reliable processing. Um, let's look at at least once processing in Storm. So if reliable messaging is enabled, you don't have to use reliable messaging. But if you do, Storm will keep track of a tuple's family tree. So bolts may emit tuples anchored to the one that's received. So in this case, tuple B is a descendant of tuple A. Multiple anchorings form a tuple tree. Um, I've not shown bolts here, but you can see that a, the single tuple A has been emitted by a spout, and then bolt, downstream bolts have, based on that information, emitted additional data. So it may be, you may receive a tuple and do a database lookup and emit additional tuples based on that. So that forms the tuple tree. Bolts can acknowledge that a tuple has been processed successfully. So an example of that is, let's say we have a tuple that comes in and we update the database. After we do a commit to the database, we would acknowledge that tuple. <coughs> 
And those acts are actually delivered via a system level bolt called the Acker. And the Acker bolt will receive an ACK and send a notification back to the spout that that, that tuple has been ACKed. And I'll get into how, how that works in a whole tuple tree in, in a minute. So bolts can also fail a tuple. And what that does is it triggers a message to the spout that it should replay the original tuple. So going back to that family tree, it says, replay that original tuple. So any failure in the tuple tree will trigger a replay of the original tuple. So one of the questions that probably comes to mind is, how do you track a large scale tuple tree efficiently? So the first thing that probably comes to mind is a enormous memory hung, hung, hungry map, but a stateful in memory map won't scale. So how do we do that? We could have millions and millions of tuples that got spawned in a tuple tree. In reality, you can do it with a single 64-bit integer. A single 64-bit integer can be used to track a tuple tree involving millions of tuples. The network transfer for an ACK message is equally as light, essentially just moving a 64-bit integer across a network. So how do we do that? It's done with some nifty properties of the exclusive OR operation on a 64-bit integer. So let's say we have three longs that are just randoms. If you take A and XOR it against itself, you get zero. If you take A, XOR itself, XOR B, you don't get zero. But if you take A, XOR itself, XOR B, XOR B, you get zero again. And what you can do, what happens, you can, that can be done in any order. So acts can arrive asynchron asynchronously in any order. And that's essentially how the ACKER system works. Acts arrive asynchronously in any order, and only when that value reaches zero does Storm know that the tuple tree has been fully processed. Trident. How many people have heard of Trident? OK. Um, Trident is a high-level abstraction built on Storm's core primitives. So it's roughly equivalent to how PIG provides a query language that compiles down to MapReduce jobs. Trident takes a, a high-level fluent API and compiles it down to Storm's core primitives. Trident has built-in support for merges and joins, aggregations, groupings, functions, filters. So very much like what you'd find in PIG or cascading, that sort of thing, but for a streaming computation. And these, these can be custom user-defined components as well. So you can define your own functions and filters, um, which is very common. Trident is stateful. So it provides stateful incremental processing on top of any persistence layer. So persistence layers like HBase, Cassandra, and others. And like I said, Trident is Storm. Um, a lot of people think Trident is something else, but Trident is just a different API built on top of Storm's core primitives. Trident's API is a fluent-style Java API that's stream-oriented. So what does that look like? Um, in this code, you create a topology, you create a spout, define a stream, and then use the fluent API to define the processing that's going to happen on that stream. Trident is micro-batch oriented. So whereas CoreStorm operates on single tuples, Trident operates on batches. It batches tuples to achieve a greater throughput and allow per batch functions and transactions. Trident batches are ordered. So in this case, we have two batches, 
batch number two will only be released once batch number one has been fully processed. Trident batches can be partitioned. So the way we parallelize um, computations with CoreStorm, the way to parallelize in, or the way Trident handles parallelization is to uh, partition batch streams. So here you see the origin tuple batch hitting a partitioning operation and the resulting partitions. Trident has a number of different operation types. There are local operations like filters and functions that do not involve partitioning or uh, network transfer. Then there are repartitioning operations like stream groupings. For example, if you're, if you're doing a fields grouping or a shuffle grouping, you're moving data between multiple tasks, so obviously um, that's going to involve some network transfer. Then there are aggregations, um, user-defined aggregations, merges and joins. Um, and merges and joins inherit from the streams being joined. So here's a diagram of a very, very simple Trident topology. So you have a spout that's emitting data. It goes into a function. So you've called the, the each method and provided a function. Then you call the each method again and provided a filter. Then you're doing a shuffle and a partition persist. And the partition persist is what is, um, that's where some of the transactionally, transactional um, properties of Trident come into play. That would be where you, you want all your partitions to be committed to a database all at once before the next batch is released. So partitioning operations define the boundaries between bolts and thus network transfer within network transfer and parallelism. So how does that look in Storm? So here's a tr our Trident topology from before. The two local functions, so those are partition local operations, those turn into a single bolt. Then there's a partitioning operation, the shuffle operation, that turns into a grouping. So that's a stream grouping, essentially a shuffle grouping. And then finally, that partition persists, turns into another bolt. So in the previous slide, I led you astray. In Trident, spouts are not really spouts. They're actually bolts. So how does that work? In a Trident topology, the spout is actually something called the master batch coordinator. And the master batch coordinator simply tells Trident, which is, I'm sorry, simply tells the Trident spout, which is actually a bolt, when to release batches of tuples. When it detects that a batch has been fully processed, it will trigger the release of the next batch. So here you see the master batch coordinator, and that's, that's something you don't really need to know much about. All it does is say, next batch, next batch, and receive commit messages when um, batches have been fully processed. And then the batches flow into the user logic, which may further partition it down the road. But the master batch coordinator is what actually controls and figures out where the transactional boundaries are and how to implement exa exactly once semantics. So controlling deployment. How do you control where spouts and bolts get deployed in a cluster? So let's say you have a bolt that relies on some resource that's scarce in the cluster. Let's say it uses some software that you only have one license for. It's only a license to run on that. How do you get that, those tasks pinned to the right machine in the cluster? Since 0.8x, Storm has supported pluggable schedulers. 
So by default, Storm will just attempt to evenly distribute the work across the cluster. Um, but you can also write your own scheduler, or Storm also comes with an isolation scheduler. What the isolation scheduler does is reserve specific machines and workers within a topology or within a cluster for a given topology. The remainder is available for other user topologies. So if a worker machine that's dedicated to an isolated topology dies, the work for that will be failed over to a non-isolated pool. So wait, Nimbus, supervisor, schedulers, that all sounds a lot like resource negotiation. And that's where Storm on Yarn comes into play. So one of the great things that Storm on Yarn will bring together is batch in real time in the same cluster. So you can run Storm on the same cluster as your Hadoop jobs and share nodes with other processing and isolate individual nodes. So in Hadoop 2.0, resource management is generalized and is decentralized and generalized. So being able to leverage that within Storm is a pretty huge gain. So one of the things that we can leverage from that is security and multi-tenancy and elasticity. So think about a, a Storm topology where you've got individual tasks that are they're getting overworked. So with Storm on Yarn, you might be able to say, OK, let's react to that in real time and rebalance the topology to add additional resources and rebalance the topology among those resources. That's something that Storm on Yarn might be able to bring to the table. So Storm's resource management system maps very naturally to Yarn. So Storm's workers are analogous to containers within Yarn. Supervisors analogous to the application master. And then Nimbus maps closely to the resource managers. So we could get high availability. Uh, some of the work that we've been doing with Storm for high availability around Nimbus to avoid that semi-single point of failure um, would be having multiple Nimbus nodes with leader election. So that would be something that would be a good job for Yarn. And then another, as I alluded to this earlier, is to be able to detect and scale around bottlenecks within your topology. And finally, optimize for available resources. So with that shameless plug, um, a former colleague in, of, of mine and I have authored a book on Storm. It has some good examples uh, that should be able to get you up and running quickly and understanding some of the um, core concepts of Storm and how those relate to user code pretty quickly. And that's available now on Amazon and from the publisher directly. So thank you very much. Um, Storm community is growing, and contributions are, are welcome. Please join us um, at storm at apache.org. And I think I have about six minutes for questions, if there are any. Go ahead. The question was, is Storm on Yarn already production ready? Uh, the status of Storm and Yarn is that there is a proof of concept of it. So uh, the engineering group at Yahoo has done a lot of work um, proving out that Storm on Yarn works and is a possibility. There are some limitations. Um, right now, there there's some minor limitations to it. So I would not say it's product production ready. Um, but what Hortonworks hopes to do in the near future is to iron out all those kinks
and make it production ready and uh, pull in some of the features that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the question is, what is the time impact of batching in Trident? Yeah. Is that correct? Um, that depends. Um, it depends on your uh, spout, your Trident spout implementation. Um, for example, a, a really, really common um, spout used for used with, with Trident is the Kafka spout, and the Kafka spout. The size of the batch is determ determined by a setting, which is a, a um, essentially a buffer size, and you control that. That controls the batch size, but ultimately, it's the the job of the um, Trident spout to make the batch size configurable. Does that answer your question? <laughs> what 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 did I what did I miss? Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of events, then the batches will be quickly together, so you may have 10, 20, 30 batches a second. But if mm -hmm. you are in a period where it's slow, then the, the batch size may become that it takes one or two seconds before the next batch is full. And I'm looking towards, okay, I want a guarantee that the maximum time for a batch is, for, for example, 100 milliseconds. Yes, there are, there are settings in Storm where you can control. So essentially, that, that master batch coordinator, um, there's a setting that allows you to, ask, to control how often it asks for the next batch. Go ahead. So if, if I'm if, if uh, Nimbus crash in, in um, while topology is applied, so not all uh, coordinators uh, already downloaded uh, topology chart, topology config servers, and so on. So uh, my question is: uh, Is uh, topology applied permissively? So it's applied only when all coordinators uh, got all data needed. So, so if Nimbus crashes during, like a rebalance operation, or crashes in the middle of uploading. Oh, so. Let's say you've uploaded your jar to Nimbus, and the supervisors are starting to download, and Nimbus crashes at that point. Um, that your your cluster would be, the topology would be in a bad state, and Nimbus would recognize that. And when it came back up, then the super because it's Nimbus is fail fast, so the supervisor, whatever watchdog monitoring demon you have, um, watching your. Nimbus process will restart it. When it comes back up, the supervisors will resume, resume download. Do you have any plans to make a topology application in phases so that the first uh, all uh, supervisors, supervisors prepare installation of new topology and only when all supervisors are ready, they are applied to Yes, that's part of some of the work that we've been doing on um, the Nimbus high availability. Yes. Um, the thing I like to say is keep Zookeeper happy. 
Um, Zookeeper is, is pretty critical to Storm's functioning. Um, but Storm is not overly heavy on Zookeeper. Um, for example, task, task assignments are just serialized data that goes into Zookeeper. Um, in Trident, um, transaction information is stored in Zookeeper. Generally, um, also heartbeat information is stored in Zookeeper. All very small amounts of data. Uh, that data does grow as the size of your cluster grows. Um, and there is an upper limit to that. Um, but that's when you get to in the, the order of thousands of, of worker nodes in a cluster. Yes? Yes, in HTTP 2.1, um, we have support for Storm. Yes, we have patch, uh, packages for it, um, installation with Ambari, and monitoring with Ambari. Um, and in addition to that, we include a number of connectors. Um, for example, connectors that the bolts for writing to HDFS, HBase, um, and a couple of other different types of persistent store. I'm sorry, I can't hear the question. No, not yet. Uh, I'm sorry, the question was, is it Yarn-based? And no, we're not. Uh, we don't support Yarn in 2.1 yet. Any other questions? One last one. Go ahead. Yes, but I'm out of time. If we can take that um, afterwards, why don't you visit me at the Hortonworks booth, and I can answer additional questions if anyone has any. Um, thank you very much for coming.